Hello and welcome to the My Heritage webinar series. I'm Jeff Rasmussen, your host, broadcasting to you live from <clears throat> Middleton, Idaho. Today we have James Tanner with us, who is live in the town of my birth, Provo, Utah, for his class, Tune Up Your Family Tree with the My Heritage Consistency Checker. Thanks to James and thanks to the more than 1,600 of you from 36 countries around the world for registering for today's live webinar. So wherever and whenever you are, glad to have you with us. And we're thrilled to introduce MyHeritage Education, a new online resource center for enhancing your understanding of MyHeritage's tools, products, and services, and to help you make the most of your family history research. The website includes a wealth of educational materials that will help you learn about every facet of MyHeritage, including articles, how-to videos, and the MyHeritage webinars. Uh, MyHeritage Education is currently available in 10 languages. And we're also excited to invite you to make history and join us for a tremendous milestone, the 24-hour Genealogy Webinar Marathon from March 12th to 13th. Uh, 2020, expand your genealogy horizons broader than ever before with 24 free back-to-back -back uninterrupted lectures from the comfort of your home. To learn more and to sign up, visit FamilyTreeWebinars.com slash 24. And breaking news just about five minutes ago, uh, My Heritage in Color uh, will automatically colorize your black and white photos. And so uh, this is the blog article. You just head up to myheritage.com slash in color. And when you go there, this is what it looks like. You have an upload photo button. And I've done that just minutes ago. And this is the original photo that I've had for all of these years. And uh, in seconds, my heritage has turned it into this. Yeah, incredible. I see you're writing about it here in my chat log. Uh, it really is amazing. So this is the first one that I've done. And I can't wait to... Well, I was going to say I can't wait for this webinar to be over so I can go and do this. I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait for this afternoon when I can go and play with this. Uh, look at all of these comments here. Uh, obviously, you're loving it also. Well, uh, another thing that we're going to love here together is James Tanner, uh, our speaker. James has a BA in Spanish, an MA in linguistics, and a JD in law. For 39 years, he was an Arizona trial attorney. He's an avid blogger and presents our, and presently serves at the BYU Family History Library. He is on the board of directors of the Family History Guide Association. He is the father of seven children and 34 grandchildren. Please put together your virtual hands and let's give James Tanner a nice warm webinar welcome. Uh, hi, James, and welcome to the show. Hi, how are you doing today, Jeff? Oh, doing great. Well, a great day for a webinar. We'll learn about the consistency checker here with you, and, and then we'll play with our with our black and white photos today. It's a big day here at My Heritage. Well, James, the screen looks uh, excellent, and the time's all yours. Okay, well, this is James Tanner, as uh, Jeff mentioned earlier. By the way, Jeff and I go way back uh, many years. Um, this is a, a really interesting topic. Uh, the consistency checker, and I have to uh, give a little bit of, uh, of uh, disclosure here, uh, can cause some consternation when you find out that your lovely family tree is not as perfect as you thought it might be. So keeping that in mind, uh, and we'll see about how this works. Uh, first of all, let's see if I can get this, there we go. One of the things that we are looking to do in our lives is to figure out our goal in family history. So what is your family tree goal? What are you trying to do with this, uh, with the work and putting it in? Is this a pastime? Is it a passion? Is it a uh, total involvement? Uh, are you uh, simply interested in, a, in knowing a, a little bit about your family or is this something where you're exhaustively working backward and, and researching back into the 15, 16 and maybe even 16 and 1500s and maybe even earlier? Is that, uh, that's something I think that all of us need to really think through and decide what our level of commitment and our time involvement is, is involved in. May I suggest something about that, and that is that we may attain, that we maintain a high level of consistency and accuracy. Even if, even if we're doing uh, just a, a simple uh, four-generation pedigree chart or three or even two pedigree 
generation, we should try to be as consistent and as accurate as possible. Now, one of the benefits of working with a an online program like MyHeritage is that you have the opportunity to be involved with their parameters, the things they have already structured. Uh, so you're not trying to invent a structure. Many of us are old enough to have gone back and started on paper with uh, uh, paper-based uh, family group records and pedigree charts and things like that. And uh, in those days, uh, the differences from individuals were individual differences. In other, one, in other words, everybody had their own way of entering information and in uh, uh, the li different levels of, uh, of opinion with regards to uh, different types of records and what kinds of records were important. And uh, so it was, it was pretty much free for all back there. You could do whatever you wanted. Uh, and the problem with that, obviously, is that we end up with a lot of inconsistency between family trees and we run into uh, a fairly high level of, of inaccuracy. So the goal I suggest is that regardless of the level of your involvement in family history and, and genealogy, that you maintain this as high a level of consistency and accuracy as you can do that. And to help you achieve this particular goal, we have the MyHeritage Consistency Checker. Um, kind of my experience with this was uh, when I began the process of, uh, of entering my information in many thousands of names into MyHeritage and working with uh, adding sources, adding uh, information to my family tree, uh, I was interested when they introduced the uh, consistency checker and uh, began uh, with uh, a very early looking at the consistency checker. Uh, despite the fact that I have been spending uh, a considerable percentage of my time over the last almost 40 years now of working on my my family tree, I still find a rather large number. In this case today, my working family tree on my heritage shows something over a thousand inconsistencies. Unbelievable number. Cannot believe. That's what I was kind of uh, trying to pre-warn you a little bit about. Now, if you have a very limited family tree, you may have no inconsistencies. And if you have, if you are meticulously careful, you may not discover any of these inconsistencies. But it's, it's uh, when you have uh, inherited information from your, from some other ancestors, from your, uh, perhaps from your parents or from your grandparents or someone, uh, and you've incorporated their information in your family tree then you may find that there are some very sizable uh, numbers of inconsistencies. So I just uh, kind of beware. The answer to that is, of course, is that's a great opportunity because it, it makes you uh, very aware uh, of the level to which you have to uh, or would need to be uh, working in order to have uh, to be consistent and have your uh, your records consistent. Now we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about what it is we're, we mean by consistency. This was introduced back in 2017, so it's been around for a couple of years, and uh, it has become more and more uh, improved. One of the things that's obviously uh, the effect is as you add names to your family tree, then you need to do run the consistency checker again because you may in fact find some more inconsistencies. They seem to seem to creep in uh, very uh, sometimes unawares. If you're if you're not really thinking about what you're doing, you may put in a date that's inconsistent. The other day, I got a notice on one of my blog posts that uh, somebody wrote in and said, "Well, I don't think the guy that you mentioned died." before he was born, and I looked at it, and I had put in 1934 instead of 1834, and so it didn't work because the, the numbers were, were not consistent. And that was a simple typo. That wasn't anything that had to do with 
copying improperly or anything. I had simply had to go back and look what I'd done and said, oops, 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 uh, typographical error there. So what is the MyHeritage Consistency Checker? First of all, it scans your family tree and identifies mistakes and inconsistencies. And there's a pretty narrow definition of what we're talking about here. Everything, when, we, when they're talking about, when MyHeritage talks about an inconsistency, there is a specific definition of each inconsistency that's being, uh, that's being considered. So it employs 37 different checks on the family tree data. So there's 37 different categories of consistency. And that's why I say it's, it, even if you're very meticulous, it's going to be very uh, difficult not to make s at least one or two of these inconsistency errors simply by virtue of the fact that you may copy a date that is wrong from an original document. The document itself may be wrong, and when you enter that information into your family tree, you may find out that it's inconsistent with all of the other dates that you already have from other sources. Uh, in each case, obviously, uh, these inconsistencies can, ca can uh, cause you to have to spend a considerable amount of time and, and uh, a lot of, and perhaps some considerable amount of research in determining what is the correct information uh, some of them are easily fixed. Uh, they're just, like I said uh, earlier, a second ago, uh, they're just typographical errors. You've just entered the information incorrectly. But on a lot of cases, there are basic inconsistencies which come as a result of very carefully and accurately copying all the data. And what you find out is that they, all the data does not match reality. and it, it just doesn't add up. It also saves you time by finding some errors that can be easily corrected. That's the good news. The really good news is that there's lots of really simple things that uh, can be just clicked on directly from the consistency checker and, and uh, corrected. And that uh, can, can in answer any of those questions without, uh, without any difficulty. Uh, there are other of the inconsistencies that will take you a considerable period of time to resolve, uh, particularly if it points out an inconsistency in the uh, birth date of a child and a parent, uh, or a parent, or the death date of either. And that uh, that comes about as a result of uh, uh, records that, uh, that don't make any sense sometimes. We've been, in the last week or so, I think I've had at least two or three different instances where uh, the records were inconclusive and in some cases contradictory. I was working on one yesterday, a family yesterday and doing research and no matter what I did, uh, it just didn't make any sense. I couldn't come up with any records that would clarify why supposedly the mother died before all the children were born. I had no dates for the mother. I had no dates for the accuracy of the children, and I'm still in the process of trying to to figure out how that's going to come out. Uh, here's some examples of the issues that uh, in those 37 different in, uh, consistency checks uh, with a child older than the parent. Um, this can happen when uh, someone adds a similar name or the same name person and is not really a person who is, pertains to that family. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as looking at it and say, oh, that uh, isn't even uh, one of the children in this family. And so it needs to be, uh, the child needs to be detached from its parents. Uh, but on other cases, if the child is older than the parent and uh, the record seems to be correct, then as I've been mentioning, you would need to go back and do some considerable research before you, uh, before you get any further along. A uh, child born after the death of a parent. Now, some of these inconsistencies may not in fact be inconsistent. Now, if a child is born after the death of its father, that can happen. And you would have to do some very careful research 
to make sure that the that that wasn't possible that the mother was not pregnant when the father died and that the child was born months after or even into a different year than the death of the father and that might happen and that is uh, that has happened uh, more many more times than just occasionally in uh, if you have a large pedigree um, but on the other hand, uh, it would be very unusual, and in fact, uh, kind of counter to na any, any possible uh, natural possibility that the child would be born at any considerable time after the death of a parent. It's, it's very possible, of course, that the mother died uh, at the time the child was born or very shortly thereafter so that that it appears on the record that they they died at the same time or there could be a mistake in the record which showed that the mother died before the the child uh, it's also possible that the uh, mother died and the child died at a very short period after the mother died in other words within hours or a day or the child died uh, almost contemporaneously and it may appear that the mother died at a, on a date that was different than the child but that's possible of course the child can can um, can be born after uh, can be the mother the child can't be born but the child could die after the death of the parent but the birth of a child before uh, or after the death of a parent is uh, only in extraordinarily uh, circumstances and within a very very short time of the of the death of the mother um, any fact occurring after the death of a person um, now this is one that requires a, a particular amount of discretion because uh, facts can occur after the death of a parent uh, probate files for example all of the dates that occur in a probate file, uh, the distribution of property, the inventory of the property, the appraisal of the property, the, the filing of the probate, all of these different uh, actions, which are facts that occur about an individual, occur after the individual's death. But some types of things do not. And uh, when, these, when this flag comes up as a, a possible uh, inconsistency, it just requires, sometimes it just requires looking at it and saying, oh no, that doesn't apply, in which case you can uh, can have the, uh, in a sense, excuse that or, or remove that um, inconsistency from the list that has been supplied by MyHeritage. And it's uh, fairly simple to do that. You just simply check it off and then it goes away and doesn't come back. So there's, there's uh, you know, quite a, a range here. Uh, being married too young. Uh, this is another problem because this is a cultural issue. Uh, cultural issue is another way, uh, is another problem that could occur uh, and it requires that the researcher have a certain amount of awareness, uh, let's say in a, a rather extensive, not just a certain amount, but an extensive amount of awareness of the circumstances, the historical cultural circumstances of the people that, that you're dealing with, uh, depending on where your ancestors came from, where they were living, uh, the time frame for uh, of when a person was married could vary considerably. Uh, there are countries in the world where children are married in a sense almost, well in the real sense they're married, at a very early age uh, into uh, very small children. Uh, and historically, it's possible that uh, a child was <coughs> promised as a, excuse me, promised as a, uh, uh, to a marriage that uh, occurred later, but was all recorded as happening when the child was very young. So there's really no fast and firm date for determining when someone who was too young to get married. But when you're working with uh, a culture that you're familiar with and you know the, uh, that there are some rules or some uh, prescriptions about the uh, age of a person before they get, uh, when they're in 
possibly to get possible to get married, then we know uh, that uh, that that is a problem. So even though these are even though the program uh, is finding the certain things as an inconsistency, you may look at it, for example, in the context of the United States or some of the Western European countries and say, oh, well, that child is too young. She was only 12 years old when she got married, and that's not going to happen. Well, yeah, there are a number of people in my family tree, if I go back far enough, that apparently did get married when they were 12 years old. And uh, so I wouldn't rule that out as, as being a, uh, an absolute. And in a sense, when you start to think about these kinds of issues, you begin to understand that it may require more than just a casual, oh, yeah, that's right, oh, yeah, that's wrong. It may require some additional research, and research that might not be directly related to genealogy in the sense that it would be entitled genealogy in a catalog. It would be historical records or cultural history or something else that uh, would indicate when it, when uh, this might have this person might have been too young to have had uh, to been married to have children. Now that's another issue because that's a biological issue. But then again, there are some very early biological instances of, of births. Uh, married name entered as maiden name. Um, once again, we're jumping into uh, something that's cultural. Uh, there is a um, there is a, a difference here of, of between a married name and a maiden name, as the name the term maiden name we're we're uh, talking about here would be the the name of the uh, of the spouse before marriage and the name of the spouse after marriage, and that there's a confusion between that if there is a change. Now, in some cultures, for example, in, in uh, Spanish-speaking countries, uh, the, the wife, when, when a woman marries, she maintains her name. She doesn't change her name. The name remains the same, regardless of the marriage or not. They may add a, a, another name on her surname list, uh, that indicates that she's married, but that does not uh, change what her uh, her full name is. So, assuming that her, that uh, from an English-speaking standpoint, uh, assuming that she uh, obtains the name of her husband automatically and all the other names are dropped, is not uh, not valid, depending on that on that type of cultural issue. But when we're talking about, um, and another one is uh, Scandinavian uh, countries, there's some differences there. So uh, once again, if the program uh, as if the program is extremely sophisticated, but in each case it requires an individual to have some understanding of the uh, historical cultural background that uh, that warrants this. And if, they, if the, 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 the program flags this kind of an issue and says the woman has the same maiden name, it's entirely possible, even from the simple fact that the two people who were married, uh, or, or more people, depending on the culture, uh, were married, uh, actually had the same surname. Um, that that, a, that a, uh, in English, a smith married an, another smith. And so the wife's name never changed, and uh, it appears to be the same as her husband. In recent times here in, in the United States, um, the, uh, the custom has been drifting away from the wife, assuming the husband's surname. And so what we have in uh, the, the United States uh, quite frequently now is either that the uh, when getting married that the women are taking uh, or keeping their own their own name, particularly if they have established some kind of professional or business kind of ID upon the marriage, that they will retain that name. Uh, I live here in a college in a university town. In fact, it's a town that has, an, has two big universities, one in an adjoining town, uh, Brigham Young University in, uh, here in Provo, 
and uh, Un Utah Valley University in uh, Orem, Utah. And uh, I can say from what I know of the professors here at these, at these universities is that many of the female professors retain their, their maiden names uh, in their professional life and never uh, are never known as uh, with the, their husband's surname. Um, and in, a, in some cases, there are hyphenations of the wife, uh, wife's original uh, maiden name and uh, the uh, husband's name. So there's just all sorts of ways that this can be viewed. And although the program uh, is going to raise those issues, and, and rightfully so, there should always be, and, the, and I guess the great value of having this kind of system of a consistency checker from my heritage is that by using the program and using the consistency checker that you will be able to uh, to make those decisions and uh, clarify uh, the information. Uh, it, the easiest thing to get clear off track in genealogy is to pick up somebody who is not really uh, was not really the spouse or uh, the of, of that in a different in a marriage, because then you're off on a completely different uh, pedigree line that of one that you may or may not be related to. Um, disconnected from the tree, uh, and this is really the first time that I've seen this. Is um, it seems like uh, over time that it's very possible that there have been people added to your family tree who, especially if you have large numbers, uh, who you still don't know how they're connected. Well, and they have a tendency to get lost if you have uh, a larger family tree, say into the uh, above uh, five or 600 names or into a level of say over a thousand names. And this is a very valuable uh, uh, consistency checker because it it gives you a list of all those people that are out there I call floaters the people out there that are not connected and they're just kind of floating around out there in the in the possibilities and uh, then you can go research those people and see if they uh, are related to you or if you just put them in there because you're interested or maybe because they were famous or maybe because of whatever reason anyway so this is uh, another way. This is, this is not exhaustive. As I mentioned, there are 37 of these, but what I did want to do was go through and illustrate how these affected and, and, and the same kinds of reasoning and the same kinds of concerns about the, the consistencies, both in the way of, of things of correcting the information or justifying the information as it stands, uh, apply to all 37 of those. Uh, now, uh, kind of get a look at uh, a family tree on my heritage, and it looks, if you kind of look at it without focusing, you might think there was like uh, some kind of spots all over it. Well, those are the icons, uh, the green and brown icons, uh, approximately brown on your screen, I'm sure, uh, that um, uh, are indications of uh, record matches and smart matches and that's uh, there's other uh, webinars that have been uh, talked about in fact I believe I did a webinar on that subject for uh, my heritage uh, and it's up on the education site website so um, that's not the topic of this particular one but one of the things that we need to, to understand is where this consistency checker comes in, and that is it's underneath the family tree, and you go down, pull down the menu, and click on the menu item, and then you have a list of your consistencies. Well, actually what happens is that the program begins examining whatever is in your family tree, and then um, uh, counting up uh, the number of, in, of inconsistencies and also telling you the estimated time left and 9% complete. 
Now in the line above at the top where you say it says tree consistency checker and it says your tree has changed since the consistency issues were last found. That means that you didn't run this every single time, that there's there may be some additional changes. You may have corrected a number of the consistencies. You may have uh, added more people and had some more problems. So you can then recalculate the report. If you don't recalculate the report, then simply the program, what the program does is simply reload the last consistency check. So it's, it's probably a good idea to wait the few minutes that it takes for the uh, program, depending on how many names you have, obviously, uh, that uh, it takes to look through the, uh, through the process. And even though I have thousands of names, there's still not a very considerable time that it uh, can be done. Also, by the way, uh, most of these items, most of anything that's running on your computer on the internet is going to be affected by uh, the speed of your internet connection. So if you have a very, very slow internet connection, some of these processes may take uh, considerably longer than the uh, than it would if you had a, a very fast connection. Um, I, I can't I can't fail to to mention this, but here in Provo, we're one of the few cities that has uh, uh, Google Fiber, and this is uh, one of the fastest uh, connections that you can have uh, right now in the United States. There are faster, but this is uh, it's very a good benefit to to be here in Provo for that reason. Um, so if I let that thing run for a while, then it ends up that I have somewhere around uh, 1,054 consistencies. Now, what I would mention is that it, as I work with the program, that number doesn't necessarily go down very fast. In fact, in my case, it's going up because I'm adding people. Uh, I'm adding more people, and apparently these people seem to have problems. Uh, then I am um, then I'm resolving, but it's always a nice goal to have that out there, and it also gives me a, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, of a let's say anticipation that I could uh, someday uh, resolve all those and and have a tree that was uh, in a sense without inconsistencies. I'm not really looking that I'm going to do that in my lifetime, but we will see what happens. There's a, there's kind of update so you can see where that is and how bad that is. Now, the, 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 there is no uh, disgrace. This is something that I think we really need to face head on uh, with having some inconsistencies in your family tree. That just happens. Uh, it's based on the fact that, that the records underlying the information that you have may have been inconsistent and you may not have, have noticed that there was an inconsistency because you added information at different times and under different circumstances and uh, just simply did not notice that that the information you were adding was uh, was not consistent so it's not like it's a penalty or a problem or you know a bad spot on your life it's simply a reflection of the 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 type of information and as you go through them, you may find that, that uh, maybe most, some, or maybe even most of these inconsistencies turn out to be explainable and um, very, um, uh, you know, perfectly correct. And then you can get rid of the inconsistencies and they won't come back and question that, keep questioning that particular issue with that particular person. So. Basically, this is, uh, for a lot of things, it's a one-time thing. So you can see what's going on here. So I've been talking about this a little bit, but let's go back just a, a, a slight bit here and think about why there are so many issues. These are some of the reasons, and, the, and some of these apply to me, and some do not, uh, but I will kind of indicate uh, how I I feel about these. Um, I most certainly have this this issue. I have an inherited family tree. I have generations of my family going back that had compiled um, uh, 
pedigrees, uh, some of which in my years of, of doing the survey and accumulating uh, what had been done by all of my ancestors previously, went back as far as 19 or more generations. Um, my initial opinion about the way I was doing this was to simply gather all that information, right or wrong, uh, put it into some format in which I was, which was evolving as the computer programs I was using uh, evolved until I have ended up with uh, a core of that information, not all of it, because I uh, was able to determine that most of what happened out, out past about six or eight generations was uh, uh, not substantiated by any kind of, of reasonable uh, resource or um, records or, or documents. And so my inherited family tree was a disastrous mess. And the number of, in, of uh, consi inconsistencies I have still reflects that that's an ongoing process. There's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, I'm back into areas where there is some serious research needed. Uh, the family I was looking at, I just mentioned a moment ago, just, uh, just yesterday, was a family where the the children were obviously born all after the wife's death date, the mother's death date. So uh, that's something that I spent some time doing research yesterday, and yes, it's still a problem, and I had looked at it before, and I still haven't resolved it. Um, in my case, I'm not I'm not uh, going to simply. Uh, delete all those people or uh, detach them from the families or try to do something like that because I have no records one way or the other. And what I inherited still may have some value because somebody may have known. And what this may indicate, the simplest explanation for this indication is that all three of these children were born uh, to a, a different mother and that this the person listed there may be a second or even a third or or a successive uh, spouse of the of the husband and uh, basically there's um, you know there's an explanation for it out there if i can find it so that's the kind of thing that i leave in there because those are unfinished research uh, issues and i would guess out of the numbers that i have of inconsistencies that the uh, the number that fall into the research category are, um, if not the majority, almost, well, probably close to all of them, but most of them, at least the majority of all of them are, are those kinds of errors. And it's uh, pretty tangly wood here. That's what the kind of uh, mess that I would uh, say that I ended up with in mine so I'm still working on it. So that's, that's why there would be so many issues in, in a family tree like mine. Uh, if you were a person who many people that I, that I uh, uh, help in the libraries, and I've been helping for many years, uh, have inherited genealogies, they come in with a file uh, that was a uh, that came off of another program, and they've loaded it into their computer, and uh, or downloaded the information, or they come in with a uh, paper genealogy, uh, even a, a, a published book of genealogy, and they are begin to enter that into their computer. They'll they'll still find that uh, in many cases they'll get to the point where there will be uh, some substantial inconsistencies. And I guess the way that I would look at this uh, from my own standpoint is don't get discouraged. Uh, just because there are inconsistencies, that's the nature of historical research. There's always going to be some level of inconsistency simply because records do not agree, do not agree. They were in court, they were uh, entered improperly. Uh, it's very simple, very, very simple ex uh, example from uh, the United States uh, federal census records. The U.S. federal census records, under the way the law existed in the United States, or exists today even, is that the census day was established as a specific day of the year. So whatever day it was, and then I'll make one up, uh, 
say it was June 1st of whatever year. That was the census year. That was the census day. Well, when, it's, when the uh, census enumerators or census takers, or, or in more recent times, the surveys that they've sent out in the mail, when those were answered, uh, it depends on how the questions ask. So for example, what if the enumerator back in the days uh, asked this question, how old are you? And the question back, of course, is how old are you when? How old are you today? Okay, so if the census taker said, how old are you today? And then the census department, the census people who were you know, looking at the records and processing the records, would then say, uh, this person was born in such and such a date by simply subtracting the age from the date of which the census was taken. Um, in the United States, with census records, that means that the, that the age of the person and sometimes the date of birth, if it's there, is an estimate, and it's almost always at least one year off. So in this case, it's, it's, it, there's always going to be inconsistencies. The census record is going to say the person was born in 1865, and if you find another birth record that far back in time, and uh, it may say they were born in 1864, or they might have been born in 1866. So it just depends on the date that the census was taken and the actual birth date. And in many cases, you won't even be able to find an exact birth date. So it will always be inconsistent. And that's, that's why there's no reason to be discouraged about the fact that there are a number of inconsistencies. And here's the alternative. The alternative, of course, is get to work. In other words, go out there and uh, and use the tools that we have, including MyHeritage and all of its features, to correct the information and make it consistent. Uh, I would caution people from becoming so zealous in making information consistent that they make the stuff up. Uh, please don't go to the stent of making up dates or, make, or, or uh, making up places uh, for events or other items in the in a person's pedigree, simply because you want it to be consistent. Uh, Emerson, the American uh, philosopher of many years ago, um, had a statement that said that consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Uh, the, the meaning of that statement is that uh, you you necessarily need to be a little more expansive to accept the fact that there is going to be, particularly in historical subjects like genealogy and family history, uh, a, a measure of inconsistency. And it's only people who are, uh, who are bothered by that uh, to an extent that it, it prevents them from, from actually doing accurate work that um, that that need to to be concerned. The rest of us we can live with a certain measure of inconsistency. But if I didn't couldn't live with inconsistency, I couldn't live with a, over a thousand inconsistencies in my family tree. I know they're there. I'm uh, I correct spend almost most of my time I spend correcting entries in my family tree, basically because a lot of those names were there. Be uh, that I was inherited. And granted, in this case, the issues can can run from those that are very easy to those that are very hard. How you approach this, what you do with the inconsistencies is uh, basically uh, your own personality and your own way of looking at uh, how you're going to do genealogy. Uh, there are those who would say, well, let's jump in and clear off all the, in, all the easy ones. Uh, the problem I've had in trying to do that is that I'm not a very good judge when I first look at it as to what's going to be easy and what's going to be hard. And when I start into, into one of the inconsistencies, it may turn out to be monumentally hard and even not reconcilable. Uh, 
and I think that's probably the case with the one that I've ran into yesterday. But uh, it could be really easy is that I could simply uh, say, well, that that mother can't be the right person and uh, remove the mother from the family and that would avoid and the inconsistency would go away. But there we would be then missing a wife. And uh, so I would need to know if that was correct. And by the way, just sort of a side note, uh, my research yesterday indicates from looking for records about the husband uh, that there was probably, uh, that the wife probably isn't the correct person and that uh, it, some other uh, the, some other person that's the, the mother of those children and that if that's the case, then that probably would eliminate the inconsistency and preserve the information about who the mother was in the family. So that's could be, but that may very easily fall over into the hard category instead of the easy category. Kind of important that you run at any time. Uh, you can see it there on the list of, of uh, family tree tools and, uh, and actions that you can take here with uh, MyHeritage. And uh, by running the consistency checker, uh, that keeps it up to date, um, but if you're simply working on it, and that's been one of your, and that turns out to be one of your goals, is to uh, make some of the corrections or all of the corrections that are on the consistency checker, then uh, doing that and looking at all those um, would be helpful because as you the correct the information that's in the consistency checker you will end up with uh, with more names, different names, and different relationships. And uh, running the consistency checker, uh, perhaps a little more frequently than you might think necessary, uh, it would be uh, helpful in picking up any of those additional uh, changes and things that have happened. And I know this is correct because I've seen the number change. So I can see that. Um, some of you may view, I'm just another note that's kind of off the subject, but I think uh, is helpful to understand, is that um, I have more than one tree of my family trees on my heritage. And this particular one that I have is a uh, from six to eight generations. This is the core family units that I have um, uh, over my uh, working years, verified and sourced. So most of the names on here, except those that are primarily, uh, I guess, if you looked at the consistency checker uh, list, you would see that almost all the names that showed up were either Swedish or Danish. And uh, part of that, uh, from the standpoint of my my particular way that I use the family tree is that I also have all of my wife's um, family tree on here. Uh, an interesting thing that's occurred over the years is that there's uh, various, uh, well, DNA tests and other kinds of tests, and, and as particularly those that look at the family tree, have determined that both my wife, I am related to both of my wife's parents in a, some distant fashion. So that's not even unusual since there are rules, you know, some findings of major studies like the one done by my heritage some time ago and published in the journal Science that showed that there was a propensity for people to marry their cousins. And so I, uh, if you go back far enough, I'll, obviously you may end up finding that that's the case. So there's your consistency checker. It's under the family tree. Um, option on the on the drop down menus across the top of the of the page um, since this slide was put together uh, there has been some revision of the my heritage website so uh, family tree still there uh, there may be some other issues that you see or some screens that might vary from um, from what you see on this and rather than, and since the changes made by uh, my heritage were quite recent, meaning just a few days ago, uh, that, that I began to see these types of changes, and there may be more, 
uh, you need to kind of keep a general uh, in mind as you're working with websites online that they may change uh, over time very frequently. And uh, because those changes occur, uh, the instructional videos, if they go back any time at all, uh, may or may not exactly match what you see on the screen, but uh, the, what even less frequent is that a feature is abandoned or removed from a website, but it is very possible that additional features like the one announced today about the fabulous idea of being able to colorize old black and white photographs is, uh, automatically and very quickly is uh, is something that would be just is going to continually upgrade and, and change what happens with the way these websites work. So there's the consistency checker and uh, clicking on that uh, family tree menu will get you to that. Uh, when you do it, you can stop at any time if you want, uh, but you might depending on your connection, I said this earlier, but depending on your connection, it may take a few minutes uh, for you to uh, to get to. Now, when you get this consistency checker and it comes up, this is the way it comes up. And over on the right-hand side, there's little up and down arrows on those bars that go across. Uh, you can see the little uh, up arrow and a down arrow. Uh, those open and close each of the categories. And uh, there are some other utilities under that gear uh, icon right above the, uh, the bars across the screen, uh, the consistency areas. And there's a print icon and then there's a refresh icon. So there's a number of different things you can do. You, I would suggest you look at the options in the gear icon and understand those. They're not real difficult and they're not real complicated, but there are some things there you need to understand more about sorting and uh, viewing. Um, there's, uh, when you have, in this case, you can see child older than old and the parent, child born after death, a parent alive but too old, a parent too young, a parent too old, et cetera. And each of these categories, and some of them you may not care about, and some you may. And so you can close those down and uh, look. You can also see that some have very low numbers, like five people. And you could quickly, perhaps, if you were really lucky, uh, resolve those. But if uh, it may, the big number, whether you have 25 or seven or 17, that is no reflection about the time period or the effort that's going to be required to resolve some of those inconsistencies. Some are easy and some are hard. So these things right over here, once again, these are the open and close arrows. Click those to open and close. Um, you can adjust the, the list by the settings menu. So you can go see uh, what uh, what things are available. That's under the gear. And you can actually choose which of these different categories that you want to look at. So there may be some of the things here in the th list of 37 items that you are not, you don't care, or you don't ever want to look at, or you don't think it's worth bothering with. And so you can simply have those eliminated and not come up and be, and you won't have to look at them and see them. So here's a way. So you can uh, see what's happening here, and those are little check boxes. This is this is what comes up with your gear, and then you can see that you can. They come in categories of errors, warnings, and uh, and things that they think are a good idea, suggestions, and so the errors, are the ones that you would be you should really get it, look at it, and check. Those are going to be simply things that have to be resolved. The warnings are those fall into those cultural areas where there may or may not be a problem depending on your particular culture. And the suggestions are just that. They're not going to really affect the accuracy of your tree to some any great extent, but they certainly will increase the uh, consistency 
and uh, the way that it, it is, um, the way that you see, what you see on the screen becomes consistent. Errors, and this is the way that they've split these up. Errors indicate an issue that is obviously incorrect. They're shown with a red exclamation mark icon, and they're the most important issues that should be dealt with first. So if, if, if this is the suggestion from my heritage that you correct the errors. The second ones are the warnings that I mentioned a moment ago, and they are indicated uh, where the data seems unusual and may be incorrect. And that's based on, you know, as I have been saying now, cultural social issues. And they are shown with a circular orange exclamation mark icon. And then notices, they're calling what they're calling notices or suggestions indicate potential problems, but they're not likely a mistake. They're shown with a gray square icon. So there's three different ways that the, that the uh, consistencies are marked so that you can see exactly how they, uh, how they range. So if you find a suggested issue that does not need correction, click the X. Now the X in this one is kind of, uh, I don't know on your screen, but uh, it's over on the extreme right side under the little down arrow, and it's uh, a little bit grayed out. But if you click that, then this one will go away and not come back. So it's gone. What you've told the computer is it's correct, even though it may appear to be a uh, to be a wrong to be wrong information. So there's the indication of the X. And uh, I on my screen it's kind of hard to see. Um, it's not an uh, it's not in your face obvious, but it's there. And um, um, so I would just you know that's just where you can go ahead and, and locate it. So here's an example of a child born after the death of a parent. This was a Samuel Baker who was born in uh, 1732. And you can see over on the right-hand side of this detail page, it says research, and underneath it says, has a red icon with an exclamation point, and it says one consistency issue. So even as you're going along in the program, once you've run the consistency checker, your people in your uh, family tree are going to be flagged so you can find them easily. And here's a blow up of that part of the screen uh, showing the consistency issue icon. Child born after the death of a parent. Um, so we look here and it says he was born about 1732 after the death of his father in 1701. Uh, that's too, way too many years for it to be any other thing, like uh, he survived the death, he was born, or he was being uh, expected before he, uh, he was born. And that would have been with a much shorter period of time. So uh, how does this get resolved? Um, well, the date for the father is appears to be exact, uh, July 10th, 1701. The date for Samuel Baker is an about date, and it's at about 1732, which means it could be before 1701. And if this person really is the son of, of uh, William Baker, then he probably was born before 1701. But that's kind of a big difference in time. And uh, the more likely explanation in this is that Samuel Baker is not the son of William Baker, that they've got the, the wrong person is here. So now we check the father's dates and we go through that and see where he was born and look at the sources that we have and see if that's actually uh, possible and he was listed, Father William is listed as being born and died in 1701, which uh, probably rules him out as being the father of Samuel Baker and or anyone else for that matter. So if he was uh, living and deceased, then he was wrong. So there was just simply here, it was a typo 
in the death date. So when I looked at the records that were attached already there in the in the file attached to uh, William ba uh, Baker, then it turned out that his actual death date was 1743. Uh, everything else was correct, July 10th, uh, the place and everything. It was a simple typographical error and it was fixed and there's no inconsistency, so he's gone. So here's one, parents too young when having a child. In this case, um, the, the numbers don't add up. They're only 12 years old. Uh, census records give different ages. In other words, when I went into the sources, I found out that he may have been a different age and that he really wasn't 12 years old. And so we look at it and find out that the information is not inconsistent in the records and uh, he was 69, so he was born in about 1791, and the problem is solved. So these are a couple of, more, of the easier types of, of uh, re resolutions of the inconsistencies, but they're, they're real. This is the stuff that I was finding, and this is how I resolved it. And so it's, it's the kind of thing that you can get um, resolved. Here's one, a date of reference occurs after his death date. By the way, that can happen. So it's a fact occurring after death, and why would this happen? And then you look at the record to see why there was a, um, an event that occurred after the death, and the research uh, is all of there. Uh, there's you know all sorts of... Uh, records that are left to be added in. There's six record matches and 29 smart matches. So there's a lot of information to, that needs to be done to research this particular person. So as we evaluate and add the record matches, we found uh, that he was in the 1901 census and that solved the problem because the death date was incorrect and uh, he needed to, and there was no fact that occurred after after the uh, after the person died, and that one consistency issue, then it still has an inconsistency a consistency issue. So now we have to go back and look and see what this. It says he was born May first, eighteen thirty, is not marked as deceased and rather is rather old, one hundred and eighty nine years old. Wow. Okay, so let's mark him as deceased. So I forgot to mark the person deceased. And that solves that inconsistency. So the idea here is to keep working. Some of the issues may only be resolved with extensive research. And thanks for watching today. And thank you, James. Uh, very enjoyable. Uh, great comments here in the chat area. It's kind of it's eye opening for. Uh, for some out there, others they're they're happy with the detailed explanation of of this tool, and uh, yeah, appreciate it. Let's switch over here. We're going to do some door prizes, and then we'll finish up with uh, questions that have come in. Our next live webinar will be presented by Rand Sneer. This is on February 25th on working with DNA segments on MyHeritage. Now, this is part of the MyHeritage webinar series, uh, which is hosted by FamilyTreeWebinars.com. So just uh, head up to Head up to FamilyTreeWebinars.com and and you can select from the MyHeritage specific webinars. Or there's a whole another there's a there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of other classes that you could watch there in the library. Now uh, time for door prize. So if you're here, you're eligible to win. Our first door prize today will be a one year MyHeritage complete plan, and this will this gives you access to. Uh, the Premium Plus Family Site subscription and to the data. And uh, so for those of you that are here, um, you're in the running. And I'm going to have my random door prize picker uh, select our winner. And our winner for this prize, we have Christine Hoff. Christine, congratulations. Uh, you've got a one-year membership coming your way. And then let's go to a MyHeritage DNA test kit. And, uh, of course, up at MyHeritage.com slash DNA. And we'll say congratulations to Mark Humph. Mark, congratulations. 
Thanks for being here today. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's there's my question slide. By the way, uh, by the way, James, I was I listened to almost every word, but uh, I was also uh, having a little fun playing up there. And and this is a uh, this is a picture. This is my great grandfather, my grandfather, my dad, and me in black and white. And I've never seen it. <laughs> like this before and I was curious is it going to get uh, get the hair colors right and and looking at yeah it's it's kind of remarkable so everyone that's myheritage.com slash in color all right let's go to let's go to some questions uh, the main question gosh uh, was where is it uh, the consistency checker located and James you explained that well and uh let me let me go up here. So as like James showed, it's just go to the family your family tree menu, click on the more, and then right here is your consistency checker. So that's how you gain access to it. And uh yeah, this is this is running live on my personal tree here now. As he showed, this is showing how complete or how much time is left to uh to generate this report. It's showing the number of inconsistencies or consistency issues and uh yeah james like like you explained um i think that most of my consistency issues are the result of an inherited tree at some point and uh and another question that was asked uh frequently is about printing this list and just looking here at the screen i can see the print button right here i haven't actually looked to see what the report uh, looks like but uh, it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's a complete report. It's just a list of all of them. Okay, okay. Them. just like what we're seeing there on the screen then. Yeah, yeah. if you have 700, you may not want to print it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 54 <laughs> sheets of paper it shows, but uh, I'm wondering. Well, except the problem is going to be that um, as you fix those, then the number is going to change every yeah. time you fix one. Yeah. And it's it would, I think it's helpful because... There are people who uh, who are work better if they have a printed list, something to check off on, and things like that. Oh, sure. That. Oh, absolutely. But, what I'm what I'm wondering, and some have asked this, is can this list be exported uh, to a file or to a spreadsheet? And um, I don't I don't know if you know that off the top of your head. I'm actually opening a spreadsheet to test it, James. So I've got Excel here, and I've copied. I've just highlighted and copied the first few, mm -hmm. and I don't know what it's going to look like. But let me hit paste. So, so put them all in one field. Let me let me hit paste this other way. Yeah, there you go. There we go. So I went to paste and then match destination formatting. So it looks like it's going to list the issue and then list the tip. List the issue and then the, so yeah, that's I mean you can you can export it that way for those of you who are asking about that. Um good. The other question that was commonly asked was, can you give the parameters to the consistency checker? And James explained that well, and that's just found right here on this gears icon. Um, now, James, the other one that's that, and I think you mentioned uh, something about this, but it might have been when I was playing with my black and white photos uh, when you answered it. If you If you notice a problem like this problem and you want to... You want to mark it as being okay. Is there a way to do that other than going and, and fixing the actual data? Oh yeah, you just um, when you select when you select it. So you're going to open it, make select that. So I click on the person's name. Yeah, and then you can check to see if it's correct. Let's say it's correct. Okay. Then you can save and continue. Okay. And then, and then I suppose well, if I you're go, gonna back. go back, yeah, close yeah. that and go back to the consistency checker. And once you've done it, the X is over there on the corner. Now you can't see it right now. You hover over the corner. Ah, oh, here yes. we go, everyone. Thank, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. That, I'm glad you said that you can't see it unless you're hovering over. So it's this little yeah. X right here that appears. That when you right. click on that, that that problem will go away. Can I do that with other problems in my life, uh, James? Um, yeah, I suppose you do, except you'll have a hard time finding the X. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so that X shows up everywhere if you need it. So good. Thank you. 
And uh, Albert, who's asking, we're up at myheritage.com. Uh, James, do you know, uh, so the the software that synchronizes with myheritage.com is called Family Tree Builder. Uh, mm-hmm. Does Family Tree Builder have this tool built into it? And it, it, yes. Is it the same it, it parameters? Original, it, it had it originally. In other words, this is my understanding. I may be you know, I may not be completely accurate, but I believe that uh, that this consistency checker originated with my with the Family Tree Builder program. Okay, and that makes then, sense. And yeah. they, then they put it online. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, any idea, James? This was asked a couple of times. Um, how it handles the uh, date issues when with the change of the calendars, so the Gregorian calendar versus the Julian calendar. Any any ideas about how it? Uh, it works with well, that. I haven't had yeah I haven't had that come up but okay. um, I am I would be very surprised that it that it didn't uh, take that into account hmm. that's built into almost every one of the major programs has that okay. as an issue available at least you know knows that it's aware of that problem okay. that's a very common problem all right and very common here in our chat log are things like this uh, where Lindell is saying nice to know about this tool never used it but we'll certainly begin now. Uh, so, well, James, we've uh, we've we've exhausted the consistency checker related questions and comments in here. And by the way, everyone, uh, this there is a syllabus that's available. It's up on the webinars registration page right now. So if you'd want to run over there, you can uh, print that out and get some uh, printed uh, instruction there. James, any final thoughts before we sign off and say goodbye? No, I, uh, you know, I, I think that what we've seen today is um, that my heritage has some pretty fabulous tools, and uh, the new ones are going to be coming out. I'm sure we're looking forward to a big conference here in Utah at Roots Tech yep. uh, in Salt Lake City, and uh, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there was some more more uh, important things that were announced uh, during the conference that's usually what happens so yep, that's the place to uh, do it we're looking forward to uh, the next couple of weeks when we get to go up to salt lake and find out what's going on well i'll see you there james uh, if you're if yep. you in the around the world if you're showing up to roots tech come say hi stop at the my heritage booth stop at the legacy family tree booth uh, i'll be running back and forth between the two and uh yeah, and if you can, and I have a couple of presentations, um, uh, classes at the My Heritage booth. Good, uh, as I do usually, and uh, so I'll be there and around, and I'd be glad to say hello. And you can find us. Uh, I have cup. I kind of be between that, the Brigham Young University Family History Library booth, and the uh, uh, Family History Guide booth. So there's going to be three places that I'm going to be around. Well, sounds like it'll be a busy time, but it's always fun, and uh, looking forward to seeing you there, James. Well, uh, yep. thanks, everyone, for being here, and you're welcome any time, uh, so wherever and whenever you are, appreciate you sharing part of your day with us, and remember, life is short. Do genealogy first. Bye, everyone. Bye, James. Thanks. Bye.